what is up youtube family welcome back to my channel if this is your first time here then it's just welcome to my channel go ahead and hit the subscribe button because you will not be disappointed unless you get a bad taste girl or you're a hater or both y'all have been loving the premiere style and so we're gonna continue to do that for the next couple of weeks so every tuesday and thursday i will be here at 12 30 p.m central standard time i noticed a couple of people that show up after the premiere starts they're a little confused so the thing is if you show up late you can rewind it back to the beginning and then watch from the beginning you don't have to start where we are in the story once you join it also my mouth is dry than a nun's you know what girl so mama is chewing on and licking on a cough drop and I'm gonna try not to make too much noise with it but in order for me to be able to talk and not eventually start spewing out dust out of my mouth I need it today's story is about Betty Broderick you might have heard this story because when it happened I noticed this was all over Oprah her children were all over Oprah everybody was all over Oprah it was a big thing but we're gonna talk about it today. Betty Broderick was actually born Elizabeth Ann Viseglia, November 7th, 1947, making sis a Scorpio. Yes, yeah, she is one of ours today. But Scorpios, my girls, hear me out, okay? Hear me out. My little nickname is Betty, though, so that's what we're gonna call her. Betty grew up in Bronxville, New York. Betty was the third of six children born to devout Roman Catholic parents. Now, her parents owned a very successful plastering business, so they had enough money to take care of all of these children. Her parents were also very strict, and they had extremely high expectations of their children. They believed deeply in traditional gender roles, and so the girls, they groomed to grow up, cook, clean, cater to her husband, and bear children. And that's just it. Their sons, on the other hand, were expected to grow up and get a job, find them a nice little Catholic wife, support his family financially, and make little Catholic children. For the most part, Betty was a pretty good kid from a good family. Nothing really outside the norm transpires throughout her childhood. Betty finishes high school and in 1965, she actually graduates from college with a degree in early childhood education and a minor in English, despite her expectations of just growing up and being a housewife. Now the same year that she graduates, she meets Dan Broderick. He's the eldest son of a large Irish Catholic family, so it's like right on brand for what her parents expected out of her. The couple date for four years and then they get married. But while on their honeymoon, Sis becomes pregnant with their first child. Well, Sis was already pregnant and quite as kept. That's why they decided to get married. I don't know if that's true or not. I'm just saying. Whatever the case, the two welcome their first child, which is a daughter, and she is only the first of many because after her, they go on to have four more children together, one of which she unfortunately loses just four days after giving birth. Now, Dan, he completes his doctorate of medicine and he informs Betty that he has bigger dreams. He wants to combine his medical expertise with law. So he enrolls into Harvard Law School. The only thing with this is that Betty was kind of waiting for her man to get his medical degree and make some good money and provide more financially to the family him now going to law school will force her into the role of being the main provider until he graduates but she is more than willing to carry the financial burden of her family while her husband is in school solidifying the coins for the future once he completes school he has literally no issue finding a job he is picked up really quickly by a good law firm but this law firm is located in san diego california so he has to pick up their entire family and move them out there now granted Betty is not 100% ecstatic about the fact that she has to now uproot her whole family, move away from all of her friends and extended family, but she is going to support her husband. That's her man and she's going to stick beside him. And so the two of them pack up everything and they move to San Diego. Nice little suburb in San Diego. Now he is working at this nice little fancy law firm. He's making good money, but they still got all these kids who need attention. Instead of Betty pursuing a job in her field, she gets a little part-time job selling Tupperware and Avon to the girls. And the bulk of her time is spent at home raising the children, tending to the household, catering to her husband. She is happy to do so, but she did expect him to have more time after school to be home with them, help her with the kids more, because that was always the reason as to why he didn't have a whole lot of time to spend with her and the kids. Like school was taking a lot out of him. Granted, I'm sure it was, okay, it's Harvard Law School. As the kids are becoming a little bit older, they're becoming a little bit more demanding and she has been taking care of them all this time pretty much by herself. And she has sacrificed a lot up until this point. She had been patient. 
She had financially carried the burden and she had not complained because she just felt like better days were coming. Like this is just for right now. And in the future, it'll be different. Things will be good and it'll be more balanced within our household. But Dan was still always away from the house at work and she was very much overwhelmed. She felt like it was time for him to make some kind of sacrifice or at least some changes that will provide her a little bit of relief. When she brings this up to him, he tells her about how much is on his plate, how important it is that he gets all of these things done, how it's not easy. And she's like, you know what? I understand all of that and all of that may be true, but the solution to that is probably you getting an assistant instead of trying to do everything yourself and do it all along. Get you somebody that can help. Hire a little paralegal or something. Dan is like, you know what? That actually is not a bad idea at all all and so he does so and he finds one right away initially when betty hears that he has found an assistant she is elated she's like good he's gonna have time for me and the kids and all of the things but when she sees who it is she is a little concerned linda is a 21 year old tall beautiful blonde pretty much a younger version of Betty, who had up until that point worked as the receptionist at the law firm that Dan worked at. Right away, Betty is uneasy about this. And it's not just about Linda's looks. Linda has no background whatsoever in law. Dan has claimed that his work is just so important and so tedious. And so she's like, of all people, if it's so important and you need so much help and you wanna do it all by yourself, why are you hiring somebody without any kind of background whatsoever? She's literally just a receptionist to be your paralegal. She just didn't understand it and she was completely uncomfortable and uneasy about it from day one. She feels like if they don't already have something going on, at the least bit, her husband is probably attracted to this woman and this woman is probably attracted to her man too. Somebody got some feelings somewhere. In the coming months, her suspicions only heighten. They only get worse until finally she begins questioning Dan about this. And she was not the only one that suspected that something inappropriate was going on between the two. All of his colleagues, all of his office mates, they also suspected that the two of them were having an affair. But Dan will always deny it. Now exactly when the affair had begun is unknown and unclear. But Betty was not wrong. The paralegal position was not the only position he was putting Linda in. They had been having an affair well before he gave her that job. Dan always denied the accusations. He would gaslight Betty, tell her that she was being ridiculous, that she was just insecure, that she was crazy and delusional even for even thinking that the two of them had a relationship that was anything short of professional. On the other hand, Linda was down to the office telling everybody their business. She would speak openly and freely about her relationship with Dan as if he didn't have a whole wife at home. But this made the office environment extremely uncomfortable because Betty would show up and bring her husband lunch to the office and everybody would just be looking like, oh wow sis he just came back from lunch with old girl they felt bad for betty but nobody had the heart or felt like it was their place to pour her to the side and let her know what was going on behind her back this goes on for three years while the married couple continue to have issues surrounding betty's suspicions that he is having an affair which he continues to deny she knew he was lying but she wanted to keep the family together she was committed to making her marriage work and keeping her family together. Betty suggests that the two of them go to marriage counseling because she didn't want them to just simply reside in the same household just to keep up appearances and stay together for the kids. No, she wanted them to be genuinely happy. Child Dan would attend these sessions and then he would leave them and go straight to the condo that he had purchased with Linda that Betty knew nothing about. Needless to say, for obvious reasons, the counseling is not working. Dan only continues to grow further distant from his wife and over time he becomes very critical of her he is making comments about her weight all the time he's talking about her skin all the time and poor betty she is always in somebody's weight loss clinic on somebody's diet or getting somebody's skincare services to try to fix the things that her husband did not like about her dan also begins to drink a bit more and his little slick comments here and there they quickly progress into full-on verbal abuse and the two of them will have these nasty little blow-ups and arguments in front of the children so now it is not a good situation or a healthy environment for anybody finally dan comes home and tells betty the truth confirming what she has suspected all along that he 
and Linda had been having an affair and he was now ready to leave her and go off and officially pursue his relationship with Linda in the right way. And so he needs a divorce in order to do so. The entire time I'm researching and filming this video, I just cannot get Bernadine from waiting to exhale out of my mind. You couldn't have started that damn company without me. Hell, I want my ass off. I got a master's degree in business. That is the visual representation for me for this because I didn't watch the TV show based off of it but anyway back to the story Betty is livid okay she is not however about to just let him walk up out of her life after all that she had given after all the sacrifices she made and all these damn kids she didn't have not at least without a little bit of drama dan had purchased a home to share with linda and so when sis finds out that said home exists and where it is she goes and drives her suburban right through the front door she burns up all of his clothes after she does this dan has her committed to a psychiatric ward and they hold her for 72 hours child would have been in there with a kool-aid smile for 72 hours straight he is released she goes back home to the children children that she said he was not about to leave her alone with raising by herself to be at home with all the time she takes half of them and drops them off on his doorstep she would do this unannounced but she would always come back and get them in one instance though she drops off all four and when she returns to pick them up, Dan refuses to return the kids to her. He keeps them inside the house. She is calling. She is upset. And so she is cursing him out all over his voicemail, threatening him in some more. Dan uses these voicemail recordings along with accusations that she had abandoned the children to try to threaten her custodial rights to them. He also financially penalizes her because they had not been granted a divorce. So he just pretty much agreed on an amount that he would send her every month to care for the house and the children and when she would pull these type of stunts he would dock her pay essentially which i thought was rather bold of him to withhold money from her after she had held down all those years being the breadwinner of the family so he can go to school like this is wild by this time dan had become a very well known and widely highly respected attorney in the area a lot of people knew him he had a lot of connections and because of this betty had a very hard time securing a lawyer that could represent her and challenge the terms of the divorce that he was trying to bring forward not many people really wanted to go up against dan and the few that did sign on to give it a try honey it wasn't long before they became intimidated and decided you know what I'm out. So their divorce, it just drags on for a really long time. And during this time, Betty also begins to receive these unmarked envelopes in the mail containing pictures of Dan and Linda looking all happy, lovey-dovey, and hugged up little selfies. It will have little short notes about how happy they obviously are. And it will also have these pamphlets for weight loss products and programs. Betty felt deep down in her little heart that it was Linda. She was like, it's nobody but Linda. Because by this time, Linda had been openly referring to her as the beast. And things only get worse when Dan tells her that he wants to sell the marital home that she was still residing in with the kids. She did not want to sell the home. She was like, no, I just want to stay here with the kids. Like, I'm not agreeing to that. But because his name was the one on the house, he was able to sneak and do so behind her back, subsequently selling it literally right from under her. Finally, after four long years, a four-year process, their divorce is finalized in the beginning of 1989. Dan and Linda are excited because they feel like they can officially begin to live their life together. Like the tie is broken between Dan and Betty and they can just move on with their lives and be happy and open, which... Linda had been open, but you know, Dan can be open now too. They can be open together. Meanwhile, Betty goes down and purchases herself a little Smith & Wesson handgun, which she says she needed for protection because she was a single mother with four children. On April 22nd, 1989, literally 10 days after what would have been Dan and Betty's 20th wedding anniversary he marries linda now linda felt like betty might be triggered by this and she was a little bit concerned because betty had threatened to send dan back to the lord from which he came and um linda was scared she tells dan you need to wear a bulletproof vest up under this tux but dan is like look my ex-wife is crazy but she's not that crazy like she's not gonna hurt anybody 
So he goes to the wedding with his tux on, no protection, and risks it all pretty much. But nobody is hurt. They have a good time. They go home and everything is okay. Or well, everybody is okay, except probably Betty. Linda then tells him that, you know, it's probably a good idea if we install an alarm system at the house. Again, Dan is like, for what? Like, that's not really necessary. For the next six months, they live in their newlywed bliss. They're happy. But the three adults together, them plus Betty, are still struggling to find a space where they can coexist peacefully and co-parent the children in a healthy environment. Like, it's still a lot of drama, a lot of toxicity, a lot of mess going on from both sides. They do have a visitation agreement now though where Betty goes and drops off the children and picks them up and she does so like she's supposed to. She don't just sneak them with the kids anymore. But one day while dropping these children off, she notices when they get to the door that instead of them waiting for Dan or Linda to come open it and let them in, her oldest daughter pulls a key out of her pocket and lets them in herself. On November 5th, Betty returns to Dan and Linda's house to pick up her children because it's now time for them to go home. Once she gets them back to her house, settled in and they're not paying her any attention, she slides that door key out from her daughter's things and return to Dan and Linda's house. Now, according to her, she had just returned there to try to talk to Dan and force him to listen to her. But sis had also taken that little Smith and Wesson. And so when she lets herself in, of course, they are not too thrilled to see her just walk into their home instead of this kumbaya moment that she claimed that she went there for. Things escalate. And in the heat of the moment, Betty pulls out the gun and shoots Linda and Dan both. Afterwards, she flees the scene and she just drives around in her car aimlessly. Afterwards, she calls her daughter and she tells her what she had done. And from there, she goes and takes herself to the police station, tells them everything that she had done and just, you know, turns herself in for it. Betty is, of course, immediately arrested and taken down to jail. Eventually, she is given a trial date. Her trial begins and it is apparent right away that people are very divided. With this case all of the character witnesses that came forward painted the same portrait of events prior to linda entering the picture betty was this lively outgoing social butterfly she was this devoted spouse very involved parent she was warm she was caring she was loving she was the type of person that would just go out of her way to help you in any way that she could she took a lot of pride in her family a lot of pride in her marriage and had always been a really supportive and loving spouse she was a girl that hosted all of the nice, lavish, extravagant events at her house to entertain their friends. Like, that's just what Betty had always given. But after Linda came into their lives, it was a huge shift, not only in her, but Dan as well. Betty had become more withdrawn. She wasn't entertaining the girls. She was not outgoing. She was no longer the social butterfly. She was very insecure. And having given birth to five children, she had gained a little bit of weight. Of course, her body changed, but she had really begun to gain a lot of weight once she suspected that Dan was having an affair. She was also known to put a lot of effort into her appearance, but that too had changed. She appeared to not really care that much. Now, towards the end, none of them believed that she was really still in love with Dan. They felt like instead she was struggling to pick up the pieces and move on because she felt so betrayed and her refusing to just go on and move forward with her life manifested into an obsession, an unhealthy obsession with Linda and Dan. It just really took a huge toll on her mental that she had dedicated her entire life to building with this man and he essentially in her eyes betrayed her and left her for this hot young blonde and not only did he betray her but he began talking you know really reckless about her just dragging her name through the mud and as if that wasn't bad enough he would do this and allow linda to do this in front of their children now what's really unfortunate is the fact that all of these people claim to have witnessed this and watched this unfold but at no point does anybody step in and try to intervene or reel her back in they just just pretty much watched this train wreck. Now granted, it's not their fault. They are not at fault at all for any of her actions, but I'm just saying, y'all could have pulled this to the side and been like, let's just not, okay? Let's just not. Somebody could have put her little profile together on a dating site or hooked them up with a cousin, something. But that's just my little opinion. Like, who, who are me? Betty's trial ends with a hung jury because some of them was feeling like, you know what? No, 
free my sis. Like I understand how she got here and yeah, no, I'm not sending her to jail for this. However, there were those a part of the jury who felt the opposite. They were like, you know what? No matter how nasty Dan and Linda were to her allegedly, this does not justify her actions. Like it did not warrant her going to do what she did that day. She had also said that the reason why she took the Smith & Wesson was because she had planned on potentially taking her own life. But she was just tired at this point. She said she felt like she was just tired. She was just, it was too much. Now, I don't believe this, but that's just my own personal opinion. And some of the jurors did not believe her either. They were like, you know what? No. She went there to do this. Her actions were not justified. And so she should go to jail and pay for the lives that she had taken because it was unnecessary. In her second trial, she is not as lucky. She is convicted and she receives two consecutive sentences of 15 years to life. So this story is really, really sad because I feel like everybody is a victim at this point, including the children. And I feel the worst for them because it's really sad and ridiculous how three grown adults didn't think about them enough to, you know, alter their actions and do what they needed to do in order to provide a healthy co-parenting situation for the kids. Betty's first parole hearing is in 2010. Two of her children show up in support of her. They speak on her behalf, requesting that she be released while the other two show up and speak against it. They were not on their mother's side whatsoever and they did not feel like she should be released at all. She is subsequently denied parole. She has her second parole hearing three years later in 2013. Now this parole hearing kind of raised some questions about her mental state and like if she's okay up there. She maintained that her actions were in fact justified but not only that she would only speak of Dan and Linda in the present tense as if they were still alive. Again they decide to deny her parole and say you know what no. She can't be released yet, not right now. Three more years pass before she goes before the parole board again. And because of her blatant lack of remorse, like she still maintained that she had done what she had to do. Her actions that day were very much justified and she did not feel bad for them. Child, because of this, they tell sis that uh, she cannot be released. She is to return to her cell. Pronto. Now, after this hearing did not go as she planned, she is given 15 years before she can try again. So she can't even try to go up for parole again until what, 2031, if I can count. Now, to this day, she maintains that she did not, you know, plan to do it, but she doesn't feel bad. The people still remain very divided, just like that first jury. And I imagine y'all gonna be the same way in the comments. Me personally, I do not believe that she went there just to talk. I don't think sis wanted to up herself at all either. I think sis went there to take them out, y'all. She had had enough. She had reached her breaking point. She was ready to exhale and expel some bullets. And so that's what she went to do. The children did a whole press tour, including Oprah. Betty, I believe, did an interview with Oprah too. I didn't watch it because I'm not giving a whole aftermath spill. I didn't feel like it was really necessary for me to do so. And y'all know mother got a lot going on. I'm moving right now. So, yeah. Now, even though I am done with this story and this video, I think I am going to go back and watch it, though, out of my own curiosity to satisfy my own questions. Because if you follow me on Instagram, you already know probably where I'm going with this. I want to understand from the kids who showed up to speak out against their mother being paroled, like, why? And like I said, if you follow me on Instagram, you probably already know my stance on some things because I posed a question, a hypothetical question, which upset some people. Like it was, it was nuts. So for those of you who don't follow me on Instagram, my hypothetical question was, in short, if your child, like, and I wanted people who were parents who actually have kids to use their actual child as the example in their mind. Because I feel like it's a little different when you got a child that you got to make up in your mind. Your actual child who has not been wetting the bed, killing cats and all of the things all their life. Like normal child is a young adult, about 23 years of age. They're dating someone and the person that they're dating is killed. Now they're arrested on suspicion and their alibi is that they was out drinking that night. And they went to your house because it was closer. It was late at night. You were already gone to sleep. They slept on your couch, honey. It was gone before you woke up in the 
morning, you never knew they were there. There's no evidence proven that they did this at all. All they'll say to you is that they didn't do it. It's looking like they're gonna get off because literally there's no evidence supporting them actually having committed this crime. But you know that they could not have been at your house that night because right before that, they had lost their house key to your home and they no longer had any access. So you know that it is impossible that they could have been at your house that night. So in your mind, you questioning like, my kid probably did do this. Now the only questions that you are asked is if your child had done this before in the past, like is it typical of your kid to show up at your house and spend the night for whatever reason? And you're like, yes, because yes, they had done it in the past. You just know that they do it this night. And that's pretty much the extent of what you're asked, right? Now, with all of this, your kid is about to walk. Like, they're literally going to get off. Would you then go and volunteer that extra information saying, well, no, I know they couldn't have been there that night because a week prior, they lost the key. I told them they weren't getting another one because they were irresponsible. And so they didn't have a way to get in, period. Or would you just not say anything? And a lot of people said that they would turn their kid in. They will volunteer this information without a question question child my baby is out of here it's pretty much what a lot of people were saying but a lot of people did say no they wouldn't they would have a talk with their kid and be like look you might have done this you might be lying i don't believe you but they would never turn their child over to the prison system in the state i was so taken aback at the amount of y'all who said pretty much they asked this grass that I went and did a little live to, to question y'all some more because I needed answers. But for me, okay, the question came up because it was a similar situation that I had heard about, right? And I was questioning, like, would I give my child up? And I went like three days and I couldn't come up with an answer. But I was feeling like I wouldn't. But then I was like, does that make me a bad person? Like, that's horrible. So I talked to Melissa about it. Like, this question would not leave my mind. I called Melissa about it and she's like, well, no, we don't have kids. But from her standpoint, not having kids yet she feels like it would depend on how heinous the crime is like if they was just like overkill and real psychotic and they ate an eyeball or some crazy shit like that like baby you gotta go but if it wasn't like something heinous she wouldn't do it and because she doesn't have a kid she was like okay let me switch it to you if it were you i wouldn't give you up like i would not volunteer anything that will cost you your freedom like i would never i don't care so i was like that is a good way of putting it in perspective and I felt more comfortable with my own stance because I'm just like, there are people in my life who I genuinely love unconditionally, right? I'm also a person that does not believe that we get away with anything. I feel like the higher power, no matter what you believe in, be it the universe or God or whomever, sees all. And so we never truly get away with anything. Like karma or somebody is going to come back for your ass. You can get away with something now, but you're going to pay for it on the back end. That's just my own personal belief. I don't feel like it's my place to punish somebody for something that they have done. An example of what I mean by this, like my own, my biological father was not a part of my life. And after some time, he felt like, after I was grown pretty much, he deserved a spot. And I always had a whole bunch of resentment. I was just like, no, first of all, sir, I do not know you. And second of all, I don't feel like I'm any more obligated to have a relationship with you than I am with a stranger because essentially that's what you are to me. Like you're literally a stranger, sis, I don't know you. That was always my stance. And then I'm just like, you opted not to be here my whole life. You are not about to just slide in after my mother has done all of the work and be a part of my life. Like, no, I'm just like, girl, no, I always had this resentment and I was always such a bitch to him. Anytime I had the opportunity to talk to him or people get my number or find me on Facebook, like I always was letting that girl have it, right? Child, it was like, I was the girl, I was like the lion in the cage. Now I'm not gonna mess with you, but if you come tiptoeing and entering this den, girl, I might just have to let you have it. Enter at your own risk and he would always risk and I would always just, now, when I started my little therapy, which I have always been open with, and I would say to anybody, I don't care if you don't have a traumatic childhood, I don't care. We all have something that negatively impacted us or affects us. And so I just recommend it for everybody. When mother started going to therapy, I was like, you know what? I got to let that hurt go. Like, I really do. And that doesn't mean that I have to have a relationship with him, but I probably would feel better if I could just release that negative energy, right? And so the next opportunity that I had to speak with him, I was just like, you know what? I forgive you. Like, granted, I still don't feel like I'm obligated to have a relationship with you. And I don't, like, I don't want it. I, however, do not harbor any negative feelings toward you because I was really only doing it to punish him, honestly and truly. Like, I knew it probably hurt him to hear the things that I said and for me to deny him this relationship and tell him why every time I got the opportunity to. And I was just like, you know what? It's not my place to punish him. Like, girl, you don't have a heaven or a hell to send nobody to. Like, who, who are me? So I was like, I have to stop doing that. And so I stopped doing that. 
And so that brings me back to this. If this was my child or anybody that I love, that I have unconditional love for, because even if you did this, if my love for you was unconditional, without agreeing with what you did or supporting what you did, I can still love you after the fact and still have that relationship. And a lot of people were just like, that's not right. Like they should go to jail and pay. In my mind, they will pay. And I don't feel like it's my place to make sure that they do. Like the lawyers and the court system, that's what they get paid for. And if they didn't figure it out and put two and two together and get four girl, I'm not gonna step in and give them the answer. Especially not for somebody that I love. And that's just my explanation for my stance because some people were really just like, nah, it's no excuse. They should be giving up, handed over on the silver platter girl. Today, don't wait. And I was just like, nope, I'm not doing it. It's the job of the prosecution to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that this person did what they're accused of and it's the defense's job to cast some doubt enough doubt for you to be like mm, like get you to be like mm, and if you go mm, then you know you can't definitively just you know punish them for this with that being said and that being the way that it is guilty people get off and innocent people go to jail every day like honestly that is the honest truth that being said i'm not handing my loved one up on the silver platter so sorry about it and i stick by what i said some people were really triggered though extremely triggered i had people in my inbox like this is somebody's child somebody's child died Think about them. And I'm like, girl, this is nobody's child. Girl, this is a hypothetical question. And even if we're going to treat it like it's a real scenario, which I guess essentially we are if we're applying all emotions, but whatever. Even if that is the case, I know that I respect that. I will want them to pay for what they did to my child. But even still, I would feel like even if they got off, they're going to pay for it. I have somebody who was close to me who was killed. And I am at peace knowing that the person who got off is going to pay for it. And that's just what it is. So that's still my stance. So yes, I even know what that feels like to be on the other side. And I still stick with my stance. One or two of the girls were triggered by that girl. They had to let me know. It was only like two people who were going that hard in my DMs. I'm like, Miss Mamas. I was actually kind of shocked too because Instagram is usually my safe place, girl. Not that the girls just agree with me. But when I go on Instagram, like, it's a good time. We just talk, we disagree, agree, whatever, right? For the most part, everybody respects everybody's stance. This is the thing. There are people out here who will be hell big, committed, and unmoved from their stance of disagreeing with you or misunderstanding you. And so it really is nothing you can say. Now on here, I go to my comment section sometimes and I, I see a couple of those people and I'm just like like are you really offended by what I said or do you just want to find a problem because I don't feel like I'm problematic I think I am extremely unproblematic and respectful of all I have my opinion but I'm very careful not to offend and you know just be reckless with my mouth like no that's not what I come here for and even with how careful I am people still quote me and apply some other meaning to what I said that I did not mean and I'm just like okay back in the day i will reply to those people and be like no that's not what i mean but after i've had a couple of instances where they just like i said are hell bent on misunderstanding me because you cannot tell me my intentions of what i meant now i understand that perception is reality so you can misunderstand or misinterpret something that i say and truly believe or feel like you know oh that's offensive or that was rude and your interpretation is not what i meant at all right importance of communication i should then be able to come back and say well no i didn't mean it like that this is what i meant but at the point in which you're gonna tell me that ain't what you mean like that's not how you felt i'm like girl it's really no use like i'm not doing it i care a lot about my character and that's why i would defend it back in the day i'm just at the point now where i feel like the people who truly genuinely do care and they support me they know like they know my heart you know what spray i really like i know i didn't spray it a little bit of the morphe sense but already but this warm one from rare beauty i wear this before my makeup after my makeup on days that i don't even plan to wear makeup because it gives you a nice little glow that's not too much. You don't look greasy. It's hydrating because you know my mother got dry skin. Child. And my eczema sometimes just don't want me to live and flourish and be great out here in these streets. Y'all also know I like to look like Jesus himself sneezed in my face, girl. So this is what that does for me. And it smells good. And it's not overpowering. It's like you smell it when you spray it, but you don't smell it after. That is pretty much it for this video. I think I already know what y'all gonna say in the comments. But we gonna talk about it anyway. Because I've stockpiled and I've completed hella videos. So while I 
finish packing, actually move and unpack. The videos can just go live and I can show up to the premiere and we won't miss a beat until August because mother is going on a vacation in August, child. And so at least for the month of June and July, the videos will upload premiere style at 1230, like I said, Central Standard Time on Tuesday and Thursday because you know that's Mother's Day. That's B Day out here in these YouTube streets. If I can keep a good head start on my videos, we might stick to that like that just might be a thing going forward forever anywho don't forget to like my video before you go because y'all be leaving and not liking and i don't appreciate it it don't cost you nothing girl but a, a hot little second a quick little one of these you know i want to hear your thoughts let's talk about it down below share the video with a friend subscribe if you have not because at this point it's like me and my homegirls are in here watching a movie that we paid for now you invited to come watch it for free but instead, you standing outside watching it through the window. It's like, girl, don't be weird. Come in. Come in and have a seat, girl. I'm going to let y'all go because at this point, my mouth is back dry and my cough drops are in the other room. And so, y'all stay safe. Have a great weekend. I love you a lot. And I will see you in the next one. Peace. Not to say that they are wrong and how they feel at all or that I disagree. I just want to know the backstory or what they feel and think. Betty grew up in Bronxville, New York. Is that the Bronx's real name? Or is the Bronx, is the Bronx the nickname? Her parents were very also, very also what? Him going to law school now will force her into the road of force him into the road, what? Now granted, Betty is not 100% aesthetic, aesthetic, as not in aesthetic, aesthetic. At the law firm that David worked at, who is David? And when the actual, and, and exactly when the fair, no, what, the fair, which Dan agrees to attend the marriage counseling, ugh, that he had purchased with Linda behind, I was going to call her Brenda, girl, why? Betty had a very hard time securing a little, ugh. Linda, she goes and picks up the kids. Who is Linda? No, she doesn't. Now, on November 5th of 1989, <clears throat> see, my voice trying to go and I ain't got time. She had dedicated. I was about to try to mix dedicated and devoted girl, and that is not a thing. It was really infor uh, unfortunate. Bet Betty's trial, Betty's tr ugh. consecutive sentence. Okay. <sighs> the video, of course. Well, hell, I ain't gonna. Why would I tell you the video going from Mary 12 30 girl? I missed the end of the video. You'll be seeing it at the end. Girl, cotton mouth.